Hi everyone, I am Toluca from Markers and Minions and welcome to our video on small groups this week. So thank you to those of you, um, I see Gail already, uh, who clicked that link. I can see comments but they show up as anonymous unless you click that link that grants access to Ecamm which is the software I'm using to go live. Um, then I can actually see who is commenting. So go ahead and click that, that way I can interact with all of you. Okay, so first of all, while we wait for people to sign on, let me know in the comments if you have started back at work yet. Um, if, you ha if you haven't, when do you go back? Um, and as we're warming up, I will also go over just the introduction, the basic stuff that I go over every time. Hi, Alana. So my name is Toluca Rivers, and I am a third grade teacher in Southern California. And I started this Facebook group a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, I think um, our, our Facebook group's birthday is coming up in later this month, I believe. Um, and I started this just to have a collaborative, positive space to talk about Benchmark and to come up with, you know, work with others to come up with creative solutions to making this giant program work. And so that is what I hope that you get from this group. Uh, welcome to the 200 plus members, by the way, that I added last night. I still have about 1,200 pending requests. So if you have any teacher friends that are trying to get into the group, please remind them to answer the three sc screening questions. Um, I don't even look in that folder, so I have like 1,200 requests that I'm not even looking at because they didn't answer the questions. So just make sure that they answer those and then they'll get sent to my other folder and then that's where I can find the request and approve them. Okay, so before we get started, I wanted to give you all the option to join my email list, this side. Uh, this is the short link, so once you type that in, you'll, you'll be prompted to add your first name and your email address and um, this will be a way for me to send recaps for our weekly lives, and then just to stay in touch in other ways besides Facebook. I also have a couple of resources that I made for today's um, video and topic that I will be sending via email just for free um, this sometime this week. So I plan on, after this video is done, I plan on writing up a nice concise blog post about it, an email that goes out with these resources, and then you have it there for you so you don't have to come back and watch this like, you know, hour long video again. So that's the link, go ahead and join in. All right, hi Gail, hi Rebecca, hi Connie. Hello, hello anonymous friends, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Okay, uh, also for my 200 new members, I'm looking at my air table right here, I have my um, whole thing my agenda planned out. For my um, new members, I do these lives weekly, I try to anyway, um, and I really like it when people comment and interact, uh, otherwise I just feel like I'm giving a presentation which like instantly scares me. So uh, join in, say hi, introduce yourself, and that's how I also get to know everybody. Um, I do have a group document that is on Google Drive. Uh, it's linked in our announcement section. It has all of our procedures for how the group runs, um, all the rules, and even like a video showing you how to navigate our group because now it is enormous. So that is, I also have a short link to that, that's bit.ly as well, slash mm, for Marcus and Minions, group rules, and it's all lowercase, so bit.ly slash mm group rules. So if you haven't checked that out, please check it out and read through it. You'll probably learn a couple of neat tricks for using this group to its fullest potential. Hi Joan. All right. So I'm going to jump right into our questions that were that were asked in the comments thread in the Facebook post thread um, about centers and small groups. So I actually took a couple of the questions and I'll be throwing them up here on the screen. If you have any additional questions, please just type them in the comments and I will try to pause and answer those ones as well. But these questions that were asked are, are big ones that come up often, so your question might get answered over the next few minutes. Okay, so first of all, first question was, what is the benefit of having groups at different centers each day? 
versus not having kids travel to centers and just staying at their desk working on their independent work. Um, I can speak to this, you know, personally, but I will preface by saying that it doesn't look the same in every classroom. I know the teachers that have students just stay at their desk to silently work on their independent task. I know teachers that have kids stay at their tables and they work with their, you know, partner or table mates, but they don't actually physically travel somewhere. And then I know teachers, and myself included, where we have kids actually go and visit a center. There's no one right way of doing it. Um, I know the benefits of each, each method are personal. Um, so the, my personal benefit to having students actually travel to their space is I know for my kids, it's buy-in. Like, they love that collaborative nature. And that's just kind of how I am, too. Um, as much as it gets on my nerves sometimes, like, you walk into my classroom at any time, and you're going to hear it. So my kids are always talking with one another, always collaborating, and they love that. And so I know that the by traveling together in their teams, as I like to call it, is, is motivation, and it's buy-in for the kids. The other benefit for me is I have these strategic groups, which I'll go into later on as well, um, how I group them, um, and that crosses over into other areas as well. It's not just language arts. So I might be teaching a science lesson, and we're doing some sort of STEM project or whatever, and I say, you're going to be completing this with your team. And they instantly know, oh, this is my team that I'm, I'm with every single day, and this is who I work well with. And I know that these teams work well together because I spend, you know, an, a couple hours every couple of weeks reorganizing them and making sure that they are these wonderful, like, self-sufficient groups. So that's just the benefit for me. Um, you could certainly have these teams just stay at tables and like just have that be your table arrangement in your classroom. The only reason why I don't do that is because I have flexible seating, so my classroom is kind of sporadic. Um, which leads me to another question that was asked about flexible seating. Uh, everyone's flex seating arrangement kind of looks different, right? I know I have like a low table with benches, and that's where the kids have their Chromebooks for the tech center because I don't want laptops on their laps. Um, I have the Read Yourself Center, the kids are just on the carpet. And Writing Center, they have a hard surface. They can use like my round table or with the yoga balls, or they can use the lap desk. Um, it just kind of whatever makes sense to you. Sometimes I even throw kids out in the hallway and say do a little a group out there if it's not too loud. So it's kind of just making, uh, making sure that you have your space for your guided reading and then um, make your arrange uh, anxiety okay hold on pause can you ever do a post about teacher anxiety I would love to hear your perspective and thoughts on that too Sunday night blues hitting hard tonight oh send me a message I'll talk to you about that okay hi Anne it's midnight here in Italy and tomorrow is our first day back at work so I gotta go to sleep oh well Good luck tomorrow, and you can always come back and rewatch this later. I wish I was in Italy. We're thinking about going next summer. I haven't been in about seven years, and my whole family's there. Okay, so I hope that answered the first question about traveling centers versus staying in your seat. All right, um, next I have, how do you pull your homogenous group to read with you from the heterogeneous groups without them missing the independent workstations? So I use the words groups and teams. So to clarify, the kids that are at their center or workstation, they are working on that with their team. The kids that are with me are doing, are my reading groups. Um, and the question is, how do you pull the kids to read with you from the heterogeneous makeups in the teams um, without missing work and the answer is they do miss work they don't the kids that read with me are not doing that center work at that time so they can have Fridays to catch up I don't I purposely don't give them a new task on Friday it's just for catch up and uh, that's a way for them to make that up um, and then I've said this uh, several a lot of times before 
Um, just for me personally, like I don't mind if they don't finish their their independent work like to completion each week, as long as they are getting some practice here and there. Uh, I, I'm really relaxed when it comes to completing that independent practice. Okay, next was, can I implement my own centers? And this was Miriam's question. Yes, you can. So the ones that get thrown around in this group a lot are the, the ones that, that are um, like the daily five type style centers. So read to self, word work, um, listening center. You can have them be whatever you'd like. There are resources in Benchmark for several different kinds of centers. Even like third grade and up, there's even cursive. So you could have a cursive center if you wanted to. Um, there's like regular handwriting practice pages if you wanted to have that in the primary grades. Um, so you can come up with whatever. And then also another thing I wanted to mention, a lot of us have been around for a couple years now and are feeling more confident in this program and have been running small groups. This might be the year that you have a small group center for PBL and just run project-based learning stations all year long. Have them be working on a project once a week. How fun would that be? Um, you could also do, what was another one I came up with? Oh yeah, um, so I got the idea because LUSD has adopted Studies Weekly along with many other districts in California. It's a specific California social studies curriculum. Finally, that's getting rolled out and being adopted. Um, you could have a social studies center where they're reading something from their studies weekly or whatever your sci science or social studies curriculum is, that can be a center, right? So students can catch up with their reading, they can do answer some science questions from their science textbook or whatever. Um, the, the benchmark units lend themselves really well to those science and social studies topics. So you can totally weave it into your ELA time, integrate it, right? Because it's similar topics. We were told at the training benchmark materials were not to be used for guided reading groups. Guided reading groups should be outside of benchmark. Uh, I've never heard that. I think that might be specific to your situation. Maybe I don't understand. But yeah, you're, you can use your benchmark materials for your centers, your center tasks. And you can use the benchmark materials, like the level text, for your guided reading. There's nothing that's left out in this program. Like, they give you more than enough. Whether you want to use it, whether you like it or not, is up to you. But they give you more than enough to make it work. Okay. Huh. All right. Uh, let's see. I had the... Um, I wanted to talk about the things to do at the centers because that comes out that comes up quite a bit around this time of year, and um, I've been getting emails lately about how to use some of the resources that I have. So a little backstory: I created a ton of resources to be used alongside Benchmark over the last two years, starting with um, small group resources. You can see where I was. I was feeling the least confident in my first year of Benchmark was with centers. So I started by creating all of these little things, these little foldable pieces of paper that students could use in our whole group instruction and then at their centers. I will preface by saying though that if you go on Benchmark Universe, click on your uh, Advance or Adelante, whatever your program is, find the Practice tab. Go into there and you'll find resources that you can print out. So they'll open up, you switch it to PDF, and you print them. Like I said, there's like text evidence questions and a one-page PDF. There's like the cursive. Um, there's the spelling and vocabulary worksheets, so Black Line Masters. And then some districts actually purchase the, the actual workbook consumable for that. Um, so there's a few things in there that you can print off and have them work on in the center. Um, okay, this is embarrassing, but I, I like scratched something on my leg and now my, my finger is like bloody. So I apologize for my bloody finger. My leg is like a geyser right now. Okay, um, 
So first things first, and I'm just going to go through the, from the order in which I created these resources, I'm just going to go through, briefly talk about each one and how to use it. And hopefully that will um, answer questions that I've been getting. So the first one is the bookmarks. Uh, these are for grades two and up. So this works where you uh, the kids are reading the text for that week and they answer the text dependent questions. So I first made these because I loved that one page resource under the practice tab where it had the text evidence questions. Um, and I used to just print that out and have that up and then but it wasn't really working out. Like students weren't really like looking at that and then answering in their notebook. So I made them into a bookmark and it's one bookmark for the whole unit. They just keep it in their magazine. And then this is what they do at in what I call it, their read to self center, or it could be a reading workstation or whatever. So that's one task. The next thing, oh, and printing, print double-sided. You might have to flip on short end um, or experiment with that. Sometimes it's flip on short end, sometimes it's flip on long end, and it's, I promise, it's your printer settings. It's not me. I know these work and these print out well for everybody, so if it's not coming out the right uh, way the first time, just play around with it. I promise you'll get it to work. Okay, <laughs> the next one, um, the word work pamphlets. So I made these because I didn't like printing out the, the um, black lines for the spelling and grammar each week. It was like five questions per page and I thought it was kind of wasteful. Um, we didn't have, we don't have the student consumable pages. So I made my own. These align with the spelling and the grammar. The there are the words there, a little explanation. And then these are my own examples, my own questions. So you could certainly use this in addition to the ones that Benchmark provides if you wanted to. I also have vocabulary practice in there as well, and sentence writing practice. The same with this, flip on the short end, double-sided, fold. None of my resources involve like lots of cutting and prep because that's not the kind of teacher I am. So that is the word work. And I get asked about that, uh, like how I use that in whole group versus in small group. Honestly, what I do, hold on, for, Whole group is I go over our words. I usually have them do some sort of underlining here, um, underlining or highlighting here, and I explicitly teach what the skill is. And then I might go and do like the first question with each one, each student, like whole class so that they know, even though the directions are there, I just go over it and make sure that they know what to do. And then goodbye, that's a center resource. I don't really use too much whole class time on this afterwards. All right, um, writing booklets. So these are aligned now for California and national. National looks different, but um, this is my California version. They are meant to go with your writing lessons, and that's true for both editions. So if you're ever looking at this and like, what is this? Where did she get this? Open up your weekly writing lessons. There's five per week read it, and then you'll see where I got the idea for what I put here. So this follows your writing lesson. So the idea is you are using this every day in your whole group writing lesson. And then what I like to do is say, okay, work on your draft, find text evidence in your center. So I might model whole class, and then the kids do it on their own in their center. I might model how to use that revision skill, how to use that edit skill, and then in their center they do it on their own. So that's how I use the writing booklet. Okay. And then um, the close reading companions, I made these last year. So these are meant to be alongside your whole group close reading lesson. So all of your lessons that are around comprehension, reading literature and informational text. Um, these are going to be, I will say everyone uses these differently, but if you, if you complete the entire thing 
in your whole group lessons, it's going to be a really long lesson. So the way that Benchmark kind of has it in the guided practice section of the lesson is you're doing a couple examples, you're thinking aloud, you're doing it together, you're modeling. Um, and then the idea is that they then continue it in their, guide, in their independent practice. In the beginning of the year, that's kind of tricky. Eventually, these can be something that they start in your whole time together, whole group time, and then they work on it independently. And then these questions at the bottom, you can have that be part of their center, or you might have everybody do that together if you really feel like you want to work on that test prep. Hi, yeah, no worries, this video will be uh, archived. It'll it'll stay saved on the group. It's just live at the moment, but um, you can rewatch it from the beginning as soon as I end it. So don't worry, and it'll be up forever. Okay, so that those are the closed reading companions. And then there are the question strips. So these are little strips that I made. These do have these do require prep. Sorry. Um, you cut out these strips. They're nonfiction and fiction. I um, print them on different colors to differentiate fiction and nonfiction. Um, cut the strips out and then I stick these in a little bucket. One year I had them like um, like against the wall, like in a bucket like that. However you want to display these. And then the students blindly pick one based on what type of text they're reading. And then they answer it with the recording sheet here. So there's the question and then there's the response. I have a couple of different recording sheets like with different kinds of lines and then space for a picture on one of them. So that's simple to use at the reading center, reading workstation. They can use, they can fill this, do this activity with anything that they've read. If they read a chapter of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, they can then pick that up and do some sort of response. Thanks, Gail. <laughs> Yeah, labor, labor of love making the close reading companions, but I think that they were worth it. Okay, um, next thing I have is the annotating and close reading sticky notes. I'm like getting exhausted just talking about this, knowing how many like hours of my life I spent making all these, but these are the sticky notes that um, I was kind of obsessed with at the beginning of next last year because I learned how to print on these. So I was like, let's print on all the sticky notes. It's so fun. So I ha came up with different uh, annotating prompts. Look, I lost one. I think Olive must have stolen it. Um, and then I also thought these would work well doing your guided reading because you can't annotate in those level text, so you could use these or whatever. Have stick them at a reading center and have students use them on any kind of book that they're currently reading. All right, and then the. Lift a line. So this is, uh, I will finish this someday. <laughs> this is uh, on my shop. It's its part of the re review and routines, one of the um, routines. That, I know we talked about it last week too, but this is really simple to throw in at your reading station as well or a writing station, whatever. And I thought this would be a neat alternative to a reading log because I saw, um, I see a lot of posts about reading logs and I'm the kind of teacher that like can't keep up with reading logs. And um, so I thought this is a nice little way to hold students accountable and have them reflect on what they've just read without there being an actual like log that you worry about getting parents to sign and all that. So the idea is that they just choose a line from whatever they're reading, can be any text, even science and social studies, and put this at a science center. And they just draw, draw, draw and write about what they read about and whatever line stood out to them. All right, whew. So, lastly, and my other computer went to sleep, there we go. Lastly, I do have a tech center because I have eight Chromebooks that I, I share. Actually, I share a cart, but I usually just have eight out at a time. And I try to incorporate some digital resources and activities for my students there. Um, Benchmark Universe Online is great and has a lot of options there. Uh, students can listen to the weekly text read aloud to them. Students can listen to the level text, the ones that are at their level that you can assign to them online. 
to listen to. Um, you can have, you can even go in to like open a level text, for example, on your end, and then at insert digital sticky notes where you can type up the text evidence questions that come along with those leveled readers. And then when students are at the tech center, they answer those questions. Um, after you, you know, you assign it to them, they open up the book, there's your sticky note that you put there, and then they can type in their responses. So that's a really good option as well. Um, I like to incorporate Google Slides, so I, a lot, long time ago, earlier last year, two years ago, I came up with the Tech Center activity, so this is just a series of slides that can be used really for any, um, really for any text. Okay, and then the unit openers, this is something I'm working on now, um, where it's just like a daily question that students can respond to digitally that align to your unit topics. And I'm, I've done them for third and fourth so far. So those are just the ways that I've incorporated technology. And I know a lot of people use Seesaw now, so that's a good option. Students can talk about and record what they've read about or something that they're researching or something that they, you know, a project they just completed or a book review or something like that. That's a good option as well. Um, so I hope that answers also Miriam's question, going back to hers, is can you come up with your own centers? And absolutely, and you can come up with what your students are working on in those centers because as long as it connects to your standards, right, and what you want students to be independently working on, then it's totally fine. All right. Mm -mm -mm. Second grade, please. What do you mean by that? I taught second grade and I used a lot of these with my second graders. So, all right. Um, Erin asked about seeing a small group lesson being modeled. She says, I never really know if I'm doing them. Oh, le yeah, I never really know if I'm doing the lesson correctly. Small group instruction is what I struggle with most and it's one of the most important parts. Okay, so while the kids are with their teams and they're working on their independent tasks, you pull your guided reading groups. So just what something what I like to do uh, is follow this like a basic structure. I use the leveled readers that come with Benchmark, and I first I sit down with my kids. They each get a book. We preview it. Oh, the unit opener, second grade, please. Yes, it's coming. <laughs> I was working on fifth. I shared this with someone else, and I got to the corn unit, and I was like, I'm going to stop here. So um, second will come after fifth is finally done. Um, so the structure for my guided reading lesson is if I first have the students kind of preview the text, we, you know, like a prediction, book walk type of thing, we look through it, we connect it, we talk about how it connects to our unit theme. It's not just a random book that I'm giving them. Um, and then I like to, depending on the level of the group, for, but for most of my groups, I read it aloud first. I just get through the whole thing. Um, and then I have them read with a buddy, and I experiment with this. Sometimes I will do like, or like just pairs, or sometimes we'll do a choral read, or um, sometimes, yeah, you know, where one kid turns this way and the other kid turns the other way, and they're reading to each other. However you want. Um, the, it's an opportunity for them to read through it and work on fluency, and it's an opportunity for you to listen and to notice and um, take notes on students reading aloud. And then, um, let's see, then I go into usually like the vocabulary and the graphic features. So we've read through the text and we, we stop and we, we talk about the different words that we come across and the different graphic features we come across. And then finally, depending on my group, but like with my struggling readers, I will do, I'll focus mostly on the key details. We'll go over what, what's this about? What is, what's important here? Um, and we'll talk about, you know, in order, we'll talk about what this text is about. With my higher level readers, we'll go into actually like the, um, the think about the standards, for example, like one through 10 or one through nine, um, how they start off very basic, ask and answer questions, key details mean idea, 
vocabulary. And then it gets into compare and contrast and author's purpose and things like that. Use those to help guide you as well. So if, you're, if your reading group is, is more advanced, try to, try to weave in some of those other standards there. Um, you can also use the lessons that come with the leveled readers. So there's the, you know, the foldable cardstock lessons for each set of readers. And each of those has a lesson for each day. The first day is always the key details, again, for the um, small groups. But there's so many lessons in there that you can pull from, too, if you don't want to come up with your own lesson. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, every level reader comes with a set of text evidence questions. And those come in the form of like little note cards. Um, I think they're perforated. You can tear them if you wanted to. They're also online. And you could focus on those answering those questions with them. I actually have a YouTube video up of, of me two years ago. I taught an inferencing lesson whole class. It was from Unit 3. It was my third Third grade might have been my combo. I think it was third grade. Uh, I taught inferencing whole class and then I pulled my small group and they were like my medium, I want to say, approaching grade level, reading level. And we continued inferencing and I asked them the different text evidence questions that came with the level text. How long are your guided reading groups? I spend 30 minutes with each of my groups, but I only see them once a week, except for my, my real struggling readers I see Monday and Friday. If you were to follow the lessons that come with the leveled readers, um, where there's like four or five, then um, you know, you'd wanna be teaching one a day to each group, so you'd wanna be doing your different, every group each day, if you wanted to. Do you always use the leveled readers for your small groups or other resources? For most of the units, yes, I use the leveled readers. For some, for one unit in particular, I remember um, for unit eight, it was back when I had my combo, we pulled, me and my teaching partner also pulled resources from like ReadWorks. I can't remember, but we pulled some other um, some other passages that we did with our small groups and we actually annotated with them and and used those to take notes but we did like we really amplified that unit and we went all out with projects and but most of the time yeah I just use the level of readers can you send a link to that video sure I will find it on YouTube and here we go this is, um, I was using a resource that I no longer have, so just ignore that. But you can get an idea of my structure with them. I'll link it after, it's too hard. <laughs> I'm on two screens. Um, okay, so, Hope that answers your question, Erin, on how to do a guided reading lesson. You can also Google guided reading and structure of a lesson and see what others do. Um, it's a pretty consistent structure in general. All right. And then I got a question about differentiation. So how do you differentiate? And then she also said, and what does this look like at different grade levels? So... First of all, the, the level text themselves are a way to differentiate. So I take the student's Lexile level, because that's what we use as Lexile, and I group students based on the different bands, and then I find the leveled reader from that unit that is as close to that band as possible. So I use the instructional reading level, so slightly above where they are independently, and that's what we're doing during our guided reading time. Um, so that in and of itself is a differentiation piece. And then also, like I mentioned earlier, if you've got a group of real struggling readers, maybe they're not even reading yet, um, take it back to just asking and answering questions about the text, you know, standard one or standard two, just talking about the key details, looking at the graphic features, you can differentiate in the types of lessons that you're teaching as well. Um, and then 
yeah, and then I wrote my little reminder about thinking of the standards, so bringing in those questions, higher level questions based on the standards. I also, with my with my reading groups that were my higher reading groups, we would make it through the level, we would get through the leveled reader quicker. So I would try to attach a writing sort of piece to that as well. So that was one thing that they did that the other groups did not. I would try to connect it to the, the unit essential question and, and weave in some sort of writing that way. Okay, let's see. Oh, Gail, that's a good idea. She says, I sometimes use the decodable text with my kiddos that are struggling or need more support with phonics. So in second grade, you can print out the decodable, decodable passages. And in K and 1, you actually have little decodable readers that you can use to differentiate as well. Have you incorporated book clubs into your small groups? No, but that sounds really fun. Like a, Benchmark has novel studies that you could do also. Um, but I think book clubs are a great way to bring in those those books that you you know know and and love already pre benchmark um, and do some sort of like lit circles that would be awesome. Do you usually complete a level text within with a group in the thirty minutes? Oh no, no. We'll use the same leveled reader for the entire course of the unit. So I'll meet with them in week one, week two, week three, and then a lot of the times I draw it out to week four even. So the kids are coming back to that text. And they also, I assign them one text per unit, right? So it's the text that's at their, just slightly above their level. And I let them know ahead of the ahead of time what their text is. And I let them keep it in their, their clipboard, their folder, so that when they are at different centers, even when they're not with me, they can use it for whatever. They can preview it. They can read through it. And then that's like their, their best friend for the next few weeks. What about fourth graders that just need fluency practice? The Reader's Theater books are really good for that. So those are the other books that are small. They're not the level text. They're, they're the ones that are black with the little yellow uh, theater lights around them. Those are great for fluency. Um, you can definitely have that be part of an a independent center task uh, because those groups are those levels in the in the um, reader theater are heterogeneous. So you could have a mix of students working, reading independently, and then when they come to you, you can also go over fluency. And the reader theater handbook comes with a ton of lessons for that as well. That's another one I forgot to mention. A lot of people use the Reader's Theater as a center. Okay. All right, I had a question about combo classes. Um, so I, I talk about this all the time. My first year with Benchmark, I had a combo, and I it was very, what I will say is very unique to my situation. So I did not teach in small groups enough as I should have. I was doing, you know, daily five and I was incorporating some of Benchmark's things, but I was having like my third graders or my my second graders doing a rotate daily five rotation on one side of the room while I was doing my whole class lesson with my third graders. And I would switch and then um, it, things got tricky like I would send some of my second graders out to another classroom for math while I did some ELA with my third graders and then I had my third graders go out to PE with the other classes while I did some stuff with my second graders so it was kind of crazy and hectic and, and obviously very specific um, but if in hindsight like if I was it was my first year with Benchmark if I knew what I know now I would have probably done centers all day so I would probably have just grouped my second and third graders based on reading level and use those level texts as much as, much as I could. And then definitely use the um, whole group text for modeling the lessons that you know are going to cross over. That key details main idea lesson is going to be across all grade levels. You can definitely do that together. Um, then there's always the question of, well, what if my second graders see it again next year? Or what if my kids saw it last year? Um, that's up to you. I, I tend to not stress about that because 
kids read the same stuff over and over again all the time anyway, and they might not always be reading it with the same purpose. Um, reading it with you might be different than reading it with someone else, different insights. So you're going to have to get creative, bottom line, with your combos, but getting your small groups up and running is going to help you, I think. And then if you do your teams, the way if you structure your teams heterogeneously, even mixing the grade levels, then um, they can be working on their own specific, like for example, their own specific word work pamphlet, but at least they have uh, mixed, mixed levels to be able to work with or get help from. Um, and I'm going to talk about the way I structure my teams in just a moment. So your bundle has all of the things you talked about today. Um, the, the grade level, I have several bundles, but the grade level bundles come with the focus walls, the writing booklets, the word work pamphlets, and the text dependent questions bookmarks. Then the close reading companions, since those are a beast in and of themselves, that's its own separate bundle. And I bundled those um, all 10 units, but you can also just get those individually. You might not even get to all 10 units, honestly, throughout the year. Um, so don't feel like you can, like need to splurge on that. And then the digital things, those are not, those are not in any bundle. Sorry, my TPC store is kind of a mess. It's kind of just like a ton of stuff all up there. I've really made a ton in the last couple years. Um, have you used the ELD component of Benchmark? We are going to be required to have a designated ELD time for 30 minutes a day. How do you integrate this into the regular Benchmark program? So the way we do it at my school is we have our EL population clustered in one class. So I did not have the EL cluster. Um, I have the, I usually have the cluster that, you know, has resource and IEPs and special needs. My partner teacher gets the EL cluster, and the way she does it is she's fortunate to have uh, someone come in and help her run her centers, so she's able to do the ELD lesson as part of her center rotations, um, but that's just the, our specific um, school site. It's not, you know, I've been at schools where our entire grade level, everybody is an EL, but where I have been teaching benchmark, we don't have that huge of an EL population. So it's easier for her to just work that into her centers. Um, so yeah, I haven't specifically used it. I've looked through it a ton and I understand how the ELD program was designed to scaffold the students into the ELA text. So you'll see a lot of crossovers and similarities there. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Regarding my TPT store, it's not a mess at all. In fact, I find it quite clear and organized, so easy to find benchmark and other materials. Thank you. I try with, like, the categories on the side. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, in addition to the Reader's Theaters that Toluca recommended, which I love, Benchmark has the Fluency Intervention Handbook. It's a paperback book resource. It's also online. You can check that out. There's um, a bunch of of um, handbooks that I'm I'm guilty of not going into too much, but there's like additional writing and language, um, phonics, phonological awareness. There's so many additional resources in those little handbooks that are also online. Okay. So I want to go over the, um, the, the, uh, things that I made today that I'll be sending out via email. Um, so I do teams and reading groups. So this is, I just typed this up today. This is basically what I would draw myself every time I was coming up with my small groups. Now, what I mean by this is my teams. These are the kids that are working on the center tasks, the, all of the different options that we went through earlier. Um, the goal, I'm just going to read it, why not? The goal is to create self-sufficient groups that work independently while you're pulling your reading group for guided reading. In order to configure teams that can work independently, here are some things to consider. So not too many playground friends in one group. You know, the you know, this is my BFF. Like, separate those kiddos so they can work. Um, boy to girl ratio. 
Um, I have a leader, so a student that will keep everybody on track. So the kind of kid that naturally says, you're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be doing this, right? So have some one of those kiddos in each group running things. I have mixed reading abilities, mixed independence levels. So students that work very well independently versus students that aren't, that need more practice working independently. Um, and then at least one student in each group who's willing and able to help peers academically. So they might be, you know, a higher reading ability, but they're not very willing to help other students. You have to find that sweet spot, you know, a student who's able academically to help and also who's willing. So I call those my tutors. So I usually have like one to two in each group who, who kids can call on if they're stuck on, you know, a problem in their pamphlet or a problem on their text dependent bookmarks. Instead of coming to me and interrupting my guided reading, they can reach out to one of their tutors. So those are the things I consider. I run four different teams. This is editable, the thing that I'm sending out, so you could always add more columns if you wanted to have more than four teams. But see, I have a leader, I have tutors, and these are your, the rest of your kids, and these are going to be all mixed. Remember to mix them, considering these factors. Um, down here, this helps me when I color code, and I, I always get stuck on these words because I don't want to like ever be offensive or whatever, but this is just, you can edit this to be whatever works for you. You know, your advanced readers, your medium to high, your on level, your struggling. Um, you can color code these and then add their colors in there. So it's very visual and you can make sure that you don't have like too many advanced kids in one group or too many struggling readers in one group. So this is how handy. I, I go over that and I adjust that whenever I need to. So if so-and-so is not working together after a couple of weeks and I need to change something, it's easy for me to just come on here erase, oh, this is a, you know, yellow student, I have to swap with another yellow student. So I keep it organized in that way. Um, and then in the teams, I created these little team posters today. I just thought it would be fun. I've never used these, obviously, I just made them today. But um, this is a way to have them display their team name. I always have my kids come up with a name. Um, you display which students are in that team, who the leader is, who the tutors are, and then any kind of jobs. So, like, for example, um, at the end of the tech center, you might find someone who's, you might designate a job, like, for someone who's responsible to plug them all back into the um, cart, or um, who's responsible for bringing the supplies to a center, or a timekeeper. You can designate little jobs that way. And then you can also assign points to teams that are working really well independently throughout the week. And you can attach some kind of, you know, competition or whatever. So this is kind of cute. I would recommend just printing this once, laminating it, and going over with a wet erase marker because this is obviously going to change every once in a while whenever you change this. All right. Um, where is – let me put up my email thing again. If you want to join my email list and get those later on this week after I've, like, crafted a blog post and everything, just go to that link and sign up, and you'll get it probably later in the week, this coming week. So your groups aren't ability grouped. The No, so the ones that are working independently at their workstations or their centers, they are heterogeneous. They are completely diverse because I need them to be self-sufficient. So it doesn't work for me when I have all my struggling readers working independently on a task because they have no one to turn to when they're struggling because I'm busy with my reading groups. Um, now my reading groups, the ones that I am pulling with me doing guided reading, those kids are leveled. So say I'm working with my, my highest readers, my super advanced readers on Tuesday for 30 minutes. I'm going to pull the advanced reader from this team, the two from this team, the three from that team, the one from that team, whatever the configuration is, they're going to not go to their center that day. They're going to come read with me and do guided reading. And they're going to miss that center, which is what I talked about earlier. They'll miss out on that opportunity to work on their task. So that's why I have Fridays reserved for catch up so they can um, go back and finish whatever they didn't get to that week. 
And the reason why I have Fridays for ketchup also is because I just with my configuration of meeting with one group a day for 30 minutes, I know I need to see my my struggling readers more than just once a week for 30 minutes. So I see them Mondays and I see them again Fridays. So I work with them double the amount of time as everybody else. And then that's also, you know, unique to me because my that group is also my group that leaves for half the day to go have services. So it's kind of, I'm doing a little bit more with them and bringing them up to speed and going over the things they miss. So I need to see them more often. What would you do if you were one-to-one -one Chromebooks? Would you still have a technology center? I'm running into the problem of too much screen time as there are so many programs available online for different centers. Probably not then. No, if you're having an issue with too much screen time, I would say definitely just have it be a different center. Um, have them like maybe just incorporate one of those other things we talked about like a social studies or a science center or a STEM center or um, you know more creative writing or whatever else you can think of that's going to relate back to your ELA time. I wouldn't say that you need a tech center. So what do you do when a student in the group does not cooperate and disrupts the group? <laughs> Me personally I say hey knock it off or something like that. Um, and you might also have to do a little bit more moving around, talk with students outside of the ELA time and say, like, that didn't work for me today. That's not okay. Or whatever your behavior management system is, kind of follow up with that afterwards. You can use the positive reinforcement. Um, if you, you know, you might need be, you might need to bring in points and it might need to kind of monetize this, uh, independent time. So I use class dollars so they earn dollars for good behavior and participation. So do you have an example of the small groups you pull while the others are working? I do have that video that I will link. I haven't watched it in a couple years. So, I hope it's good. <laughs> I'll link it afterwards. The excess of screen time is the reason to use the fun paper copies that Tulka offers. <laughs> yeah, kids love folding stuff. Um, yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay, um, one other thing, a couple other things that I put here at the bottom. Student teacher, what to do? Laura's wondering if she's going to have a student teacher for the first 15 weeks. What's the best way to utilize the second person in that room? Um, I said, and this kind of goes to something, another question that someone answer, asked in the comments that I didn't address yet too. Um, how do I introduce centers? Let me start with that. I do a week of trial run. So we go over expectations and and ideally, like this is gonna be this is gonna be enough so that you don't have that many kids acting out and being disrespectful during that time or or distracted, whatever. But I do enough uh, reviewing routines and going over procedures. And then we actually do a week of trial run where I'm not sitting with my guided reading group. I don't pull a group. My kids are going to their centers and I'm walking around and i'm I'm troubleshooting and I'm helping students log in because they forgot how to log in over the summer break or um, they don't know where the supplies are for this one or they forgot or I'm observing and I'm saying like oh those kids can't actually be together things like that so um, I am available during that first week and then okay so with the student teacher I wrote they can start by getting kids settled but I wouldn't use them as a monitor. So this is one of the questions, like, do you have them monitor? I wouldn't use them as a monitor because then that sends a message to the students that there's going to be someone that they can turn to um, when during that independent time, you really want to foster that idea that they're supposed to be working on their own and self-sufficient and relying on their team and collaborating so that you can leave the teacher alone to do the guided reading time. So that's not, personally, that's not how I would use the student teacher for the whole time. Um, the other thing is, like, I think back to when I was a student teacher, and I think back to when I had a student teacher a couple years ago. They want to teach, right? They, they love it. They love writing their lessons and trying them out. So give them a group, a guided reading group. You can give them, you know, your own lesson plan for them to do. You can have them follow the lesson plan and benchmark with that level text, but actually give them the opportunity, and that way you can, you can see double the amount of groups, too. 
Um, I said I wrote that they could also do running records for you if you have to level your students still. Um, you can use the benchmark has the quick checks that you can use to get their independent reading levels where it's like a little running record and then you know similar to like dibbles or whatever it is and it gives them that letter at the end the guided reading level you could teach your student teacher how to do that and then they can go sit out in the hallway and assess students for you you could use them that way if your district allows um i also wrote that they can plan social studies or science connections and kind of run those have them be have them do like a little stem center and or have them teach your science for a little while that's kind of helpful and then, um, yeah, just any sort of opportunity where they are getting to teach. Okay. Um, what do you have the kids do in each center? Do you have a list of activities for each center? I do daily five centers as well, but my groups are grouped based on ability, so I handpick the benchmark resources for the groups. Um, yeah, you can do a must do or a may do. I have my, um, the resources that I went over already, that's what I use in my classroom. So my kids start with those and then if they finish, they can move on to, um, we kind of brainstorm, like you can do creative writing or you can catch up with, you know, your big cheese writing, which is something we do in our class, or you can, um, you go into your, uh, your reader and highlight words. If you're at the word word center, you can find new words. You know, just things like that. You can come up with a may do um, if they don't actually get through their, that must do activity. But like I said, I have 30 minute centers and it's usually a good amount of time. So if your centers are any shorter than that, they probably won't even really finish that first, you know, the writing, the word work, those sorts of things. All right. And then... The flex seating, I think I went over that. I don't have a lot of room in my classroom. So you could, um, again, you can have, you can find designated spots to have them travel or you don't even have to have them travel. You can just have them work on their own at their flex seating spot. I'm so excited to do the big cheese this year. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Yeah, that's fun. All right, guys. So I think that's it for today. Um, let me know if you have any more questions. I can answer them in the comments. And then I will work this week on getting ready for my workshop. Oh, my gosh, that's Saturday in Sacramento. Um, and then I'll work on getting that blog post done that kind of consolidates all this information. And then I'll get that email out with these for you to download. All right. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a fantastic week. If you're going back to school this week, good luck. Enjoy. I love the first few weeks, the honeymoon stage. Bye, everyone.